Hey besties, welcome back. As always, titular but ever-changing music corner. I'm your host, uh, Sniffles the Clown. I've been waiting for three days to shoot this video because it's already late. Hoping my allergies would go away, but guess what? Uh, they're not fucking going away. So bear with me sounding nasalier than I already do anyway, usually. But today we are doing a sequel, a follow-up to a video I made a couple months ago that was mostly in good spirits, though I did upset some people with albums that I classified as bad albums. And in that video I looked at bad albums that have one really transcendently great song in the mix. So today it's time to do the opposite. And I'm far from the first person to make a video like this. It is a staple for music-related YouTube channels and one that often gets people very, very heated because online, particularly in places that discuss stan-heavy pop music and especially, especially on hip-hop Instagram and hip-hop Twitter where the entirety of an album is worshipped by all of its fans, artists' entire discography are seen as perfect, like, say, Tyler the Creator, when that's obviously and sometimes painfully obviously really not the case. But here I did my best to look over the last six or so years of reviews that I have been doing and pick out albums that I really genuinely think are fantastic that also have songs that are true to form just flat out duds. These aren't just songs that are bad relative to the high quality of the rest of the records they're on. These are songs that are bad, period. And while there are maybe a couple more notable older examples, these days there is one track in particular among indie heads that you will see cited as sort of the best and most common example of this phenomenon where a great record has a bad song. Josh Tillman's third album as Father John Misty, Pure Comedy, is seen by many people, including me, to be this hilarious, expansive, very socially witty and critical collection of wonderful indie folk tracks from Josh. It is a long record and an indulgent one, but one that rewards you for all of that indulgence throughout. Though pretty much everyone does agree that there is one song on this record that is just trash. It stands out like a sore thumb in pretty much every way a song can, and that's the song Two Wildly Different Perspectives. One sad sense Y'all go to hell On this track, Father John Misty trades out the detailed and instrumentally verbose collection of backings that he delivers on most of these songs in favor of something much more tepid, much more stripped back, much more formless, and much less engaging. But the real kicker is the actual material on this song, which takes this really dorky, head-ass, centrist position that really seems like it should be above Father John Misty. When this record came out, a lot of people critiqued it for the arrogance that he portrays on, say, a song like the title track, where he peels back to look at humanity as a whole and some of the many mistakes that we've made along the way. But strangely enough, it's when his political savvy is aimed at the present day that he comes up with some of his most tepid critiques. When he talks about the past and the future, generally he has quite a lot to say, but on two wildly different perspectives, you are getting some talking points that will certainly make your eyes roll, and probably something you've seen repeated by some of your dumbest friends on the internet. It pushes this moral equivalency that is stupid and doesn't hold up to much thought, and I'm just not sure why it made it onto this record. While we're on the subject of indie music, uh, one that, that really kind of does feel like bullying because the Time Skiffs, the new record from Animal Collective, I and many other people think that this is the band's best record in at least a decade. And I still highly, highly recommend it. Some of my favorite songs of the year turn up on this thing. I love Prester John. I love Struck With Everything. There's just a lot of good material. But even across their last couple of records that fans weren't crazy about, I'm not sure Animal Collective ever hit a low as low as the song Walker. This track is a really hokey, pseudo-tropical piece of psychedelic pop with these 
really weak, really just mundane refrains that they beat you over the head with. This extremely hokey, very dorky instrumental. It's all so not weird and not strange in the way that Animal Collective normally is. It's almost like they were trying to shoot for their same brand of outsider psychedelic pop music and spin it into a tropical vibe, a beachier vibe, but what they landed on is something that sounds like what the Beach Boys were doing in the 90s, and if you know the Beach Boys in the 90s, you never want to be compared to that. And these next two tracks on the list are a little bit different. While I don't think either of them are great songs on their surface or even from like a songwriting perspective, they do have an Achilles heel. And in the case of the Avalanche's track, The Noisy Eater, it's one that it wears on its sleeve. I'm hungry, I want something to eat, something with a crunch and very sweet. Just woke up so you know the scenario, I'm craving cereal like cherry. This is a song I was really, 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 really excited about when the initial news of a new Avalanche's album was breaking. I had been in love with pretty much every single they released, and when some of the credits and features for this thing came out, I was really excited at the prospect of hearing Biz Marquee, a very animated and underrated rapper jump onto an avalanche song that also featured a Beatles sample of all things that they went through seemingly quite a bit to get cleared. And the results here are just fine. The song's okay, but what makes it completely intolerable for me is the like ASMR-esque eating sounds and crunching and chewing that are mixed into it. It literally makes me gag when I hear this song. And I know a lot of people will see that as like an overreaction of some kind or an oversimplification of the objective of the song, but the fact of the matter is it is just so, so unpleasant to listen to on account of those sounds. And if the song underneath was great, amazing, I could probably find a way to tolerate it, but in its current state, it's definitely my least favorite Avalanche song, period. Similarly, almost shockingly similarly, and yet somehow even worse, uh, we have Melanie Martinez, whose sophomore album, K through 12, is pretty good. I recommend it. It's a really interesting and lavish pop record with a concept that runs throughout and tons of great songs with a lot of really hooky themes and refrains that tie everything together. I, I like this album quite a bit. But one of the worst songs on the record from a songwriting and performance standpoint, the track Nurse's Office, is made a million times more unbearable by the fucking gross ass sounds in it. Don't cut me, punch me, just let me go into the nurse's office where I float away the pill as the From band-aids ripping off to people coughing, God bless you if you can listen to this song in headphones without literally throwing up because the sounds are so obnoxious, so gross, so like omnipresent in the track that I just, I can't even envision how anyone could honestly like genuinely listen to this thing and enjoy it. The next couple of tracks are less outwardly and shockingly bad and more just kind of surprisingly boring and lame given the artists that made them, starting with Charlie XCX, whose self-titled Charlie record is one of the best pop records of the last decade. It is an experimental and exciting, vibrant collection of wonderful, wonderful, wonderful both pop and hyper pop songs that is contemporary, but also like looking towards the future and, and the sound of pop to come. There's not enough good things I can say about this record. But also, it has warm on it. You gotta tell me the reason why we could fall in love. You gotta tell me the reason why you wanna open up. Warm, which features Hayam, also an artist that I'm quite a big fan of and whose music I've enjoyed in the past, is definitely the most boring song of Charlie XCX's entire career. It is so flat, the instrumental is so spare, in such an uninspired way for a record that is so impossible to ignore. This is just like the most 
gloss over song of Charlie's entire career. I'm just not sure how this was going to work. This was going to fit in with all the other grand and intense statements she makes across this record. I know that it's almost cliche to dislike this song at this point, and there are other songs on the record that also aren't great. <coughs> But still to this day, the initial impression I had of Warm the first time I listened through this record persists, and that is just... why? Similarly, we've got The Weeknd, uh, an excellent artist, but one who admittedly have difficulty transitioning from great mixtapes into making great albums. It took a while, but he finally delivered with his best full-length studio album to date on After Hours, which really had everything. It had big hits, it had fan-favorite deep cuts, it saw Abel taking his sound in new directions, it also saw him revisiting some old sounds. There's some fan-favorite eras of his career. I really, really enjoy this thing. One of the better pop records I've heard in the last few years. And yet, it contains, smack in the middle of its track list, a six-minute long black hole that evaporates all interest, all care, and all mystique from this album that is disguised as the song Escape from LA. Pillow talk to me about the men who try to get between They buy your bags and jewelry yeah. They think you're kind of Seriously, if you listen to like House of Balloons era weekend and think that it's too reserved, too spacious, too moody, check this song out because it's all of those things taken to such an extreme that there's literally nothing left. No catchy refrains, no interesting bits of instrumentation, no compelling instrumental development whatsoever. There is really just nothing to chew on across this song's entire runtime, and it is such an outlier on what is otherwise quite a hooky and infectious record that it doesn't even feel like it could have possibly come from the same sessions with the same writers and producers. I don't know the story of this song and how it came to be, but it stands out like a sore thumb on an otherwise pretty good record. It's just a shame that the six minutes you have to spend wallowing with this song are an unskippable part of listening to After Hours in its entirety. Next up, one of the selections I think could definitely get me in some trouble, because unlike a lot of these songs, which are a little bit more universally disliked, I see a lot of love for the Childish Gambino song Zombies. All I see is zombies walking all around us. You can hear them coming. This album, Awaken My Love, is easily his best. Such a refreshing change of pace and new direction for his sort of stagnant rap career. Such a breath of fresh air, and so many of these tracks inspired by classic funk and soul, in particular. George Clinton, Funkadelic, Parliament, stuff like that. It shows up all across the record, and one of the ways that it shows up is on the song Zombies, where Childish Gambino goes for a really authentic reinterpretation of when Funkadelic songs would be at their most strange and weird and off-kilter. And while George Clinton can do that with the best of them, um, Donald Glover, he fumbles it really badly. You can even argue that this isn't the only point on the record that he goes for something zany and funkadelic inspired in this specific way, but god does he pull it off so much better on other tracks. And no, it's not just the weird, ugly, awful vocalizations that he makes across the entire song, though those are pretty unbearable. There's just so many other problems with this thing, from the way that some of the refrains just cut off and stop in an extremely awkward way, to the instrumental, which also stands out like a sore thumb on this record, compared to how lively and vivid so much of it is. This song just comes off flat, and stale from both a production and an instrumental side, and it's just kind of lame. One of the biggest ways that you can mess up a good record is with a terrible sex jam. In the future, if I were to look at all of musical history, there's even the potential for an entire list of good records with one terrible sex jam on them, but I'm gonna keep it just one on this list, and that one comes from uh, Amine's sophomore album, Limbo. This is a wonderful little pop rap record. 
pop, 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 rap record. This is a wonderful little pop rap record that shows off so much of Amine's versatility and talent. There are futuristic bangers on this thing, like Pressure in My Palms. There are introspective and reflective tracks like the absolutely incredible Fetus with Injury Reserve. And there are plenty of very catchy, very strong pop songs out there in the meantime. And there are also plenty of great, hooky, catchy, immediately infectious pop rap cuts in the mix as well. But there is also the track Easy with Summer Walker. I'm singing R.I.P. All I need some loving. Some fucking this. Now, I like Summer Walker. I like Amine. I had no reason going into this song to think that this collaboration wasn't going to work, but if there is such a thing as negative sexual chemistry together these two on this song they have negative sexual chemistry i feel like anybody could make a more sensual song than this i like joe talbot and cardi b could make a song with more sexual chemistry than this track before i listen to this again i would listen to like nardwar and zoe de chanel crossover on a bedroom anthem and no, it's not just the chemistry. This is also pretty weak performances from both of them. I've heard both of them do this well. In particular, Amine on the great track Veggies with Ty Dolla Sign, where he proves his capabilities in making a bedroom anthem. But here, it just does not work. So stiff. The melodies so whack, so bad on the song. Like many of these other tracks, the production is so flat and stands out so badly from the rest of the tracks on this record, I think. I mean, it really, really shows off his versatility all across this track list, and this is one point where he just tried something that was maybe a little outside his conventional wheelhouse, and it did not work at all. So now we get to talk about the worst song of Kendrick Lamar's career. Um, great, incredible artist, arguably does have a perfect record in his catalog, but there are a lot of less than perfect moments to be found. Uh, real obviously jumps to mind as does the Kodak Black song from Mr. Morale. But no Kendrick album has lower lows than his breakout into the mainstream following to Pippa Butterfly 2017's Damn. And on here you have a number of tracks that I would call mistakes from the kind of hokey love jam love to the really kind of obnoxious ya. Yeah. But ultimately, uh, there is nothing on this solid album that is worse than the track, God. This would die for life. Hmm. Yeah. Laughing to the bank like, ah -ha. There is a bit of a recurring theme with some of the songs on this list whose just refrains plod out in the least melodic, floppiest, dullest way possible, and that is most certainly the case on God. Even if Kendrick's singing was drastically improved, these songs would still come off so flat and so lame because it's just, the refrains suck, and the way that they're delivered in sequence on this track, there was no way to even imagine how it could have been good. And while I do get what he's saying on this track and how it fits into many of the themes that come up on the rest of the record, that's not enough to save it from the hideousness that is almost every other element of the song. I feel beyond confident in saying that across all of his studio material and even Untitled Unmastered and some of his early stuff, this is definitely the worst thing I've ever heard Kendrick put on a project. Finally, the last song, another hip hop track with another flat instrumental and kind of bad vocals, and that is the Freddie Gibbs and Mad Lib song, Gat Damn. I was so excited for Bandana when it came out, and it mostly lived up to my expectations. To this day, I think it's a wonderful hip hop record, a great sequel to their original Pinata, and a fusion of minds that are just extremely talented when it comes to making music like this. But for all the great songs they deliver, there is Gat Damn, uh, which sees Freddie Gibbs doing a lot more singing and 
there are points where I've heard him sing on tracks that it's worked. It's been a lot better than this. I don't think anyone thinks that Freddie Gibbs is the strongest singer in the world, but when he's playing it particularly low key with the right instrumental and tone, it can work. The problem is on this song, it doesn't work. And it's also the worst singing I think I've ever heard Freddie put on tape. But not only is the sung hook bad, it sort of infects the verses. There is this melodiousness and harmony that he tries to maintain, even through the brief rapped verses that show up on this song, and it, it kind of soils everything. I think when you're talking about Freddie, it's a rapper whose confrontational intensity is so much of what makes him interesting, what makes him such a force that cannot be ignored. And on this song, not only is he sounding ignorable, he's also sounding bad, amateurish, uncomfortable, out of place. I'm not really sure how anyone on the quality assurance side of things could have heard this song and thought it was up to par with the rest of this fantastic record. So yes, this is a subject rife with hot takes. Those are some of mine. In my opinion, those are albums that I reviewed that I really liked, but have one uh, steamingly dull point in the mix. Uh, everybody is going to have their own scorching hot takes when it comes to this subject that you're free to leave wherever you can find me. And uh, I'll be back at the end of this month with a recap. And then next month, the biggin, the big fish of 2022, the top 50 songs of 2012 list, one that I've been working tirelessly to put together and I'm very excited about. Such a great list, probably the best list of songs for any of the decade retrospectives thus far, and uh, I'm really excited about it.